Hello and welcome to The Print. My name is Soumya Pillay. I'm a senior assistant editor covering environment and science here. And uh, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, anybody who's been following our science content lately would know that we've been doing a series of interviews with the first Vigyan Puraskar awardees this year. And uh, just uh, letting you know about what the awards is, um, we, uh, Last year, the Ministry of Science and Technology uh, brought all the science awards under one category called the Vigyan Puraskar. Uh, we have three categories under this award. We have uh, the Vigyan Ratna, which is the highest recognition in the field of science and technology. We have Vigyan Shri and Vigyan Yuva. And after uh, interviewing uh, some of the brightest minds in the field of science, we have kept the best for the end. Uh, we are very honored to have Professor uh, Govindarajan Padmanabhan with us today. Um, he's a very eminent biotechnologist, biochemist. He has done a lot of work around uh, molecular sciences as well. He was He's a recipient of uh, Padma Bhushan, Padma Shri, uh, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award. So Vigyan Ratna is just one of the feathers in his very, very eminent career. Uh, Welcome to the Prince, sir, and thank you for speaking with us today. Tell us a little bit about your most significant contributions, um, especially in the field of mal malarial parasite and recombinant DNA. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I joined, you know, uh, I should say, Indian Institute of Science in 1961. So it's more than 60 plus years of science. I've been there except for my connection with the University of Chicago. I went to the University of Chicago 10 times. Essentially to bring back technology to India. And every time I come back, I run a workshop and get all uh, scientists, important scientists in India and, and try to transfer whatever I have learned. You know, that's how I thought uh, contribution can be made because we were very primitive in uh, molecular biology in the 1961. You know, that was the era when Watson and Crick called, uh, called, got Nobel Prize uh, for solving the structure of DNA. And India was just uh, probably starting and we were one of the very early ones to have started on molecular biology. Initially, I was working on basic uh, questions, you know, uh, I, you, I took the cytochrome P450 as a model system. You know, cytochrome P450 is a group of genes or proteins present in liver and it's responsible for drug metabolism, simply to put that way. Drugs are, you know, we take drugs and they are metabolized and then secreted. And they are metabolized, and you need and cytochrome P450 plays a very important role. So I look at I look at but I, but I look at it from the molecular biology point of view. How is it cytochrome P450 induced? What are the factors that regulate its induction? You know, induction means it, it, the levels increase when you take a drug. And uh, classically, we used to use phenobarbitone, it's a sedative. It induces a cytochrome P450. So I used that system, the RAT model, and then asked questions like how is it metabolized, how is it induced, uh, what is the gene for cytochrome P450, formation of messenger RNA. Like that, questions went on, and cytochromes contain a small molecule called heme. And heme became my center of gravity. Like, I asked this question, what does this small molecule do to the protein? P450 is a big protein. Heme is a small molecule. What does it do? And then we were surprised to find uh, heme regulates the synthesis of the upper protein. Upper protein means the protein part. The small molecule regulates. So if you don't have heme, 
For example, if somebody with uh, iron deficiency, anemia, they don't make heme, they will not make the hemoprotein. That's how you don't get hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is hemoprotein. I use cytochrome P450, hemoglobin, cytochromes, all of them are hemoproteins. So this question went on for uh, maybe two, two and a half decades. At that point of time, I thought, okay, I have asked several basic questions. How do I apply? Then I hit upon malaria parasite. Why malaria parasite? Because malaria parasite has several stages of growth. One of the important stages, it grows in our blood. You know, that's how we get infected and then it causes the disease and so on. So I use that model. The parasite is known as Plasmodium falciparum. In the human parasite. There is also a mouse model that is infected with Plasmodium bergii. I use these two models alternately. The human model we can't study in the human. We have to study in culture. The, the Plasmodium falciparum is cultured in the laboratory and ask questions. If you, for example, if you inhibit him synthesis, we found it doesn't make uh, cytochrome. It doesn't make cytochrome P450. So that's how, uh, you know, and the parasite grows all right. It's very interesting. The malaria parasite makes him. One we was wondering, why should it make him? Because it is inside red cell, it is getting heme from hemoglobin. You know, red cell contains a lot of hemoglobin and the hemoglobin contains heme and the parasite gets heme and heme is toxic and it de detoxifies it. But at the same time, it makes heme. It doesn't make sense. It is getting tons of heme from hemoglobin, but it is also making heme. Why does it make heme? That was the question. And then we found it has to make him for it to be virulent. The parasite can make in the animal model, cerebral malaria model we have in the animal, in mouse. It will produce cerebral malaria only if it can make him. If I block the heme synthesis, it cannot make you know, it, it doesn't produce cerebral malaria. That's how I thought, can I have a drug? If I inhibit heme synthesis, cerebral malaria is not produced in the animal model. Now, so like that research went on and ended up with uh, two molecules, uh, griseofulvin and uh, Turmeric contains a, you know, curcumin, extensively worked out. Now, these two molecules I, we came up, can be, they be used to prevent cerebral malaria. Now, griseofulvin, we call it as a repurposed molecule. Repurposed means griseofulvin is actually used to treat skin infection. It's extensively used even today for weeks together. But we found it can also inhibit heme synthesis. It can also inhibit cerebral malaria in the animal model. Therefore, we have come up with a new molecule, I mean, a repurpose, because it's already known molecule, for a new application. Can it produce cerebral? Because now malaria, there's only one drug that works that is artemisinin. Artemisinin derivatives are used. And the parasite develops a resistance for every drug. As we know, chloroquine doesn't work in plasmodium falciparum. I must tell you, the two major forms of plasmodia, falciparum and vivax, in India, we have 50% vivax malaria, 50% falciparum malaria. In Africa, 90% is falciparum malaria. And falciparum malaria is deadly. 
in the shin. That is the one that causes the death. Vivax malaria, but Vivax malaria can, you know, create a lot of problems. Uh, so, although it does not produce death as itself. Anyway, these two species are very important. And uh, we have been asking whether griseofulvin, this kind of molecule can be used because artemisinin resistance has spread. Chloroquine is no more effective in falciparum. We need new molecules. That's how we came up with uh, griseofulvin. And the target is new because it inhibits heme synthesis. Nobody has studied this uh, heme and heme synthesis inhibition. Uh, that the basic aspect has led to one molecule which can be used to treat uh, cerebral malaria. We are ready to do clinical trial and we have collaborated with the National Institute of Malaria Research. They have taken up this molecule and they were about to start a human clinical trial, then COVID struck. So they were all busy with COVID. And now hopefully they will start a malaria clinical trial. So this is so far as the malaria research is concerned. And of course, I retired in 98, but I still continue to be active. And I had several students and one of them is now a leader. And he works at the Institute of Life Sciences, Bhuvaneshwar. And he works on, he continues with the problem. And I am active sitting in uh, Institute of Science. Uh, we have a Skype call uh, twice a week or so. And we are quite, and you know, that keeps me busy. That's how malaria is there, continues to go. They will try to take it to clinical trial because Bhuvaneshwar, uh, Odisha, is the fulcrum for malaria, you know. Malaria is a major uh, affliction in Odisha. Odisha. Uh, so, of course, we believe uh, malaria is the coming down, has come down. But um, Arun tells me it's, it's not really true. They still see there's a lot of tribal population in, uh, uh, in Odisha. And there is still death. They, they don't know the cause. They don't know it's due to malaria. They get high fever and they die. But actually, if you really look at analysis, then you will see it's due to malaria. Mm. So I keep continuing to work. Uh, this is how my interest in malaria research continues. Uh, sir, you were speaking about some of, uh, like when you started off molecular bio biology, not a lot of work was being done. Even now, molecular biology, biotechnology, uh, these are considered upcoming subjects, so to say. So uh, if I may ask you, when you started off, what were the kind of challenges uh, that you faced in the field and how, how have you seen the field itself grow in India particularly? See, at that stage in 19... Uh... 60, I, I became a faculty around the end of 60. And then at that time, uh, for example, uh, genome, human genome was considered as a black box. Everybody was working with bacteria, E. coli. Even Nobel Prizes were being given only in E. coli system. So I was wondering, you know, we should translate it to the higher organisms, go into eukaryotic organisms. That's how I switched over to, to mouse model, from bacterial model to the mouse model. And, uh, you know, people said, no, no, it's very difficult to work and all that. But then we found it's possible liver cytochrome can be induced. And basically, Molecular biology is a fascination for people, for students. Even now, after so many years, uh, when people come for interview, ask them in biology, what do you want to do? They will say molecular biology. <laughs> but then ask them, they don't know. They don't define molecular biology. But they will keep saying, no, no, I want to do molecular biology. See, molecular biology is like biochemistry. It's a huge subject. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's, uh, that was the stage at that, you know, 
but it is uh, easing down when uh, much much later the genome sequence sequence strategies were available dna sequencing you could sequence dna for example the dna contains actually only four alphabets two purines and two pyrimidines present maybe 3 billion 3 billion times these are present in the human genome is so huge but it's just four bases keep on repeating but unless you know how to sequence you know the interestingly of the human genome of the any genome hardly 1.5% makes proteins all the proteins we have in our body hemoglobin growth hormone insulin whatever you they are all accounting for only 1.5% of the genome so the question is what is the rest of the dna is doing but the dna is what we call as transcribed dna has to become rna rna has to become protein therefore they make rna and then that's how we have this concept of rna world rna is more uh, many classes of rna only messenger rna makes proteins there are other types of rna which uh, you know which are, have other functions to do they may help the messenger rna i am putting it in very simplistic language uh, they may help the messenger rna to make proteins so the central dogma is dna makes rna rna makes protein but as i said they only account for a small percentage of the dna what is the rest of the dna doing so this question is still not completely answered they probably have a regulatory function they have other functions to do uh, so that is a very uh, but we didn't have tools at that time when i started research we had no clue how to sequence i was one of the earliest ones to start sequencing dna how to sequence i mean in those days there was a chemical method and had the enzymatic method but now uh, dramatically you know if you sequence 500 bases is a big achievement now 3 million base space will be sequenced within a week maybe within a day technology has changed so much in the last 60 plus years so much it has changed no the whole thing became new generation sequencing it's called the ngs so the whole sequencing method has changed therefore it's become a child's play now sequencing dna has become child's play but when i started it was a big deal to to sequence a small number of uh, small dna to do but Uh, we we did it and you know we were so excited at that time and you know uh, very happy and claiming we are sequence we are sequence <laughs> but that's how it started yeah asa uh, you have also done a lot of work around uh, agriculture and uh, you know development of uh, uh, genetically modified uh, you've also had very strong opinions on this could uh, i mean uh, the government is also now pushing gm crops as the future of agriculture uh, what are your opinions about uh, gm crops as the future of agriculture in india i did i should say experimentally work on gm crops but i had because of a molecular biology background it's the same thing with gm crops also so in gm crops you know now there are two approaches possible one is to bring a gene from outside and introduce for example bt cotton that is a gene from bacillus thuringiensis and it protects against uh, all these uh, plant pathogens let's say and uh, this has been introduced in other you know in maize and other crops can be 
that it will bring a gene from outside. And I have been saying this is something which we should do in India. But there have been a lot of activists, you know, who were against this. Uh, you are bringing a gene from outside, uh, all kinds of things. I didn't believe, you know, uh, anything, anything. Uh, you bring a gene from outside. How does it make any difference either then? It introduces the resistance property to your crop. Uh, but, that, you know, that uh, I don't think government of India has been serious, in my opinion, in so far as GM. Although the Prime Minister as such uh, has said, uh, has been encouraging, has been for GM crops. But uh, on the ground, I don't think any GM, other than BT cotton, we have not gotten into any GM crop. And then came another revolution for which people got Nobel Prize and all, gene editing. Gene editing. That is, you don't bring gene from outside, but can you modify the existing gene? As I said, the gene has got only four alphabets, which are repeated many times. Now, can you change one base? Can you take uh, change a few bases and change the entire property? That means you are not bringing any gene from outside. You are modifying the present gene and will that introduce resistance? Now it becomes pest resistant, for example, let's say. Or it is resistant to abiotic stress. Abiotic stress means, uh, you know, stress against uh, uh, no low rainfall, no water, uh, or high temperature. Uh, you know, it is impossible. Gene editing. So that, although I have been arguing, at least okay, GM crop, at least you said you are bringing gene from outside. Gene editing is something which uh, you know you are only modifying the present gene, and that uh, modifying a few bases. Uh, you know, but this has happened in the. Western countries, they are going ahead. Gene editing is very, very popular. Now, I don't think in India we have neither gene editing nor uh, GM. Uh, you know, in, of course, the research goes on. But I, don't, I haven't seen any application on the, in the field as such. Uh, sir, the government uh, has also released the new policy to sort of promote and encourage biotechnology and biomanufacturing, BioE3. The cabinet on Saturday has approved it. Uh, how do you see the policy itself? Do you think it's going to uh, have any effect on our innovations on ground and, you know, just to convert innovations into, uh, you know, real world solutions as well? Yeah, I went through the... Uh, they call it a bio V3 policy, you know, uh, environment, uh, employment, uh, economy. The, uh, economy, economy, employment, and environment. So basically, it uh, looks like it is, uh, as you said, biomanufacturing is one. That means from chemical industries, change over to bio, where you use only fermenters. It is not an open system, it's a closed system. To that extent, you know, you don't produce greenhouse gases. So the release of carbon dioxide is not happening because fermentation process is essentially carried out by microorganisms. And it is in a closed system. Therefore, can you change your, I don't know whether it would be possible to do biomanufacturing of all molecules, but there are many molecules which can be made using biomanufacturing process. Where you use uh, microorganisms, bacteria, yeast, to produce whatever you want. And you use in a fermenter, fermentation systems to do that. That is essentially biomanufacturing process. But of course, you have other components of this E3 policy, uh, like you know, uh, waste reutilization, recycling. Uh, many things are there like that. You know, zero carbon 
emission. That is the main uh, criteria there. And bio AI is also another interesting concept, you know, bio AI. Basically, which means they use AI to screen natural resources, plant resources, or microbial resources. Are they coming up with new, new proteins? There's a concept called smart proteins. Protein, uh, avoid animal proteins and go to plant proteins. Go to microbial proteins. You know, as a, uh, from nutrition point of view, can you replace uh, animal systems to plant systems? Uh, because plant proteins are okay. Plant proteins are uh, as nutritious as uh, animal proteins are. So that is one of the important uh, approaches that uh, we can. Uh, consider. Uh, of course, as I said, bio AI, there's a foundry, there's a call it bio foundry, uh, where you design all this, basically, you know, design and scale up. Many things happen in the laboratory. But scaling up becomes a huge issue in bio manufacturing processes, you know, that is something. And in, in, a, in a sense, it is a new skill development. We really need to train a lot of people because if you have to switch over from chemical manufacturing to bio manufacturing and uh, you know using other approaches like acids, alkalis and so on and changing over to fermentation technology using microbial systems. You need to train a lot of people. You need to have skill development. These are some of these challenges actually. Basically, yes, that's what we need to do, yeah. Uh, sir, coming to my last question, uh, what, I mean, you're the first recipient of the Vigyan Ratna Award, which is the highest recognition in the field of science. Uh, you've had like many recognitions before this as well, but what were, what, what is your reaction on receiving the awards? And also if you could tell us a little bit about the awards itself, because this is the first uh, such award that has been given out. There was a lot of controversy last year because uh, the awards were centralized. Not many scientists were happy that, uh, you know, cash incentives have been taken away from uh, from scientific recognition. Uh, your response? Well, you know, I, know, I knew I was nominated. I was nominated by, you know, there's an alumni group of our department in the United States. They saw this, uh, apparently this was advertised in, uh, sometime in January. <coughs> and they had given a time scale also. January to February and then consideration. Uh, so they in fact called me and said, you know, GP, they called me GP. And they said, this is, uh, you know, where uh, we saw, we want to nominate you. Uh, I, okay, nominate. <laughs> then they found it's not an easy process. There's a form to fill. And that form is very complex. They said you ask your student to fill it. No student can fill it. I have to fill it myself. <laughs> because there's so much details they want. And so I filled the form. I filled the form and sent it back to them. So they probably they modified it here or there, added some superlative things, and then forwarded it to the government. Uh, that was all. Then there's another group called BIRAC, Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council of the Department of Biotechnology. And I have chaired it since its inception. I only stepped down last year, 2023, because I am. 86 now, I better, you know, <laughs> do some, give place to other. Anyway, uh, till that time, Bayrak, when I stepped down, all the members also stepped down. So they, they formed what is called the Bayrak Alumni Group. This Bayrak Alumni nominated me apparently. So there are two groups, 
both the Institute alumni and the Bayer Academy have nominated me sometime in January. And actually, I, I didn't know much of the details, but I knew I had been nominated, honestly, I should say so. But uh, I forgot about it because there was an election. I didn't know whether the new government would be interested. Uh, I didn't know that. And nothing was there, you know, because originally they had given dates. This will be done on this date, this will be announced on this date. Nothing happened. So everybody forgot. And suddenly I got a mail. Uh, 10 days before August 23rd, I, I think August 23rd was the award ceremony. Forget. Anyway, 10 days before that, I got a mail saying, you know, you have been chosen as uh, Vigyan Ratana. That was so, it was a bit of a surprise for me because although I knew uh, I was nominated, but I was, didn't know I was nominated. There's a Ratana business. That's what's the, causing all the problems. You know, it's a lifetime award. It's okay. So, Vigyan Ratana, they have put, and then everybody is saying, oh, is it equivalent to Bharat Ratana? How do I know? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, uh, it means scientists, scientists will get only. This Ratana at the most, they cannot get Bharat Ratana. So a lot of questions. They were asking me at the award time and with all these people. I said, I don't know all those details, you know, whether is it the same as Bharat Ratana or is it only meant for scientists? But maybe, you know, one thing, scientists probably find it difficult to compete. All these award winners, you know, they, they are more of lab people and Many times, probably, it, maybe it's a good idea to have a stream of their own. You know, as you said, uh, Sri Yuva, uh, then uh, Ratna, or whatever. Yeah. So I was happy. You know, it's okay. I, it doesn't make a difference. I should say honestly at this stage of my career. But I respect, I respect the government. It's very nice of them to have given me this award. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, it was uh, great having you on board to tell us about such a wide range of subjects. And thank you uh, for sparing time to speak to the print. I would also like to thank our viewers for staying with us and uh, being a part of this interview. Uh, for more such science content, please subscribe to the print. Thank you. This was Soumya Pillai.